Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to the Connection Church. Thank you for being here today. i uh, got a great service planned for you, as always. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Today I want to talk to you about the stewardship of a sacred secret. The stewardship of a sacred secret. Ephesians 3, the Bible says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if, that word if really is better translated since, it's not, it's not really if, but since indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you, and stewardship means the management of someone else's belongings that you're responsible for. That's what stewardship is, the manage of someone else's belongings that you're responsible for. Everything that we have belongs to God, so we are stewards of all that we have, and we are responsible for it, and we're responsible to God for it. And everybody will give an account of what you did with the things he gave you. So Paul is saying, indeed, you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me, to him, to Paul, for you, that's the believers, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery. The mystery. Now Paul uses this word mystery three times in this passage, and it refers to a truth that has been concealed by God during Old Testament times, and now after Christ's ascension, after his death, burial, and resurrection, and his ascension into heaven, um, it's been made known to his people. So it's a mystery that was concealed from people. God did not let people know about it. He didn't tell people. You know, God doesn't tell everything all at once to people. He doesn't do that. And he did not do that with this mystery. Uh, but now he has made it known to his people, as Paul is writing. He says, as I wrote before in brief, and he's, he's really, he's kind of referring back to Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 2. He mentioned this mystery that he's talking about here in uh, Ephesians 3. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. So he said, as you read this, you're going to understand my insight into it. This, this thing that God had concealed, but now he's made known to his people. which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men. So he says that people didn't know that before. You know, the Old Testament prophets didn't know about this mystery that Paul is writing about. They didn't know. As it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit of God revealed it to them. You know, they wrote under inspiration of the Word of God, under, under the Spirit of God led them to write. So the holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Now there are some very important world-changing, life-changing, uh, history-changing things that God had concealed in the past. Uh, but now after Christ has come, they've been revealed. Now what is it is the big question. What is it? He says here in verse 6, to be specific that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I'm just going to read the rest of this, and I'll come back and make comments. Of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ, and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things, so that the, manif the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in heavenly places, in whom we have boldness and confident access 
through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulation on your behalf, for they are your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. The stewardship of a sacred secret. Now, if you've been a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ any length of time, you have realized that God has given you tremendous insight through His Word in divine truth. Uh, you know things much of the world does not know. And this knowledge you have comes with responsibility. You see, you've been given the Holy Spirit of God. Unlike the world has, unbelievers have, they don't have that. You've been given the Holy Spirit of God, and the Holy Spirit of God teaches you and guides you into all truth. Listen, guys, if you're not living in the truth after you've heard the truth, it's because you do not have the Holy Spirit of God in you. Because if you have the Holy Spirit of God in you, once you hear the truth and learn the truth, the Holy Spirit of God is going to say, that's the truth. And then you're going to start living in that truth. So believers, genuine believers, live in the truth. You know things that other people, most of the world, do not know. You know things. That's kind of frustrating sometimes. It's re it really is. Because you're sitting here saying, man, I know that's not right. I know that's not the way things should go. And yet they don't. And you've been given the ability to understand spiritual things. You've been given the Word of God to read and to study and to practice. And because of that, you know how to live your life more skillfully than other people know how to live their life. And all you have to do is watch a Christian live their life. You can tell there's something different just by the skill in which they live their life. They don't make dumb decisions and dumb mistakes. I'm not saying they don't ever do that. I'm just saying <laughs> compared to unbelievers who are doing it every day, every second, all the time. Yeah, that was funny, wasn't it? <clears throat> I know me, I know I make some dumb decisions. But you live your life more skillfully. You do. Uh, you understand things that many people don't understand. You understand the sacred things of God. You understand them. And some Christians understand them to a greater degree than other Christians do, but just give it some time. It'll, it'll start clicking for you. You'll understand because you have the Holy Spirit of God in you. Now, you haven't always understood these things. Uh, you may understand them now, but there was a time. You still had to learn them, and you had to learn them from someone else. And I want you to get this right here, what I'm about to say, because it's extremely important for you is that you did not God did not reveal listen to me God did not reveal his sacred truths directly to you or to me now the reason why that's important for you is because there's a lot of people out there that says that God reveals sacred truths directly to people today he does not what he has done is he has given his word, the word of God to you, and you read the word of God, and the Holy Spirit applies the word of God to your spirit, and now you know divine truth. But you do not walk around one day praying, oh Lord, give me a divine truth, and he just pops it in your head. It's from the word of God, written down, preserved by him. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Good. Okay. Just want to make sure. God did not reveal his sacred truths directly to you or to me. Not directly. We know them because God used his apostles, the apostle Paul, 
and the apostles of the days of Jesus Christ and the New Testament prophets. We know these truths because God revealed it to them and then they revealed it to us. And they wrote it down. And they preached it and they proclaimed it. And the word of God is here. This book right here, which is uh, translated into more languages than any other book on the planet Earth. There's more ancient copies of this book than any other, far more than any other book that's ever been written on the planet Earth. Thousands of ancient copies of this book. Some of the old, a lot of the old, old books, the ancient books, they might be lucky if they had two or three copies of it. But this, thousands and thousands, the evidence is overwhelming that this is a supernatural book. It's overwhelming. God has preserved his word. Why? Because we need it. He doesn't speak directly to us. He speaks to his apostles and his prophets and they wrote it down and now we read it. Do y'all know why I'm saying that so emphatically? So you'll read the Bible and plus there's a lot of heretics out there saying something different. So I have to emphatically say that to you. Don't listen to people. If they come up to you and say, I got a word from God and he told me to say this to you. You say, no, he didn't. I can read the word of God myself. And find out what God has to say to me. I don't need you to tell me. And they wrote it down in Scripture. Now here in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul tells us the sacred secret that changed his life and it changed the world. And you know what I'm talking about. He's talking about, he learned about the church. The church. And I'm not talking about the Catholic church. I'm talking about the church, the real church that Jesus Christ said he was going to build. And the Apostle Paul learned about that, and he's going to tell us about that. He talked to the Gentiles about this. This did not exist before Christ. Before Christ, it was the Old Testament. It was the nation of Israel. Uh, God did save Gentiles in Old Testament times, but things changed in New Testament times. By the way, God has <coughs> created three institutions. He created the family which is the most important institution. Uh, it's extremely important. Uh, John Jones is going to put on a men's breakfast here in a couple of weeks. I think it's in the bulletin. And he asked me to teach on the subject of a godly man. And I just want to say, if you're the head of your family, you need to be a godly man. So I want you to come to this breakfast and hear what that is. Being a godly man. And the family is the important, that's the first thing that God created was the family, Adam and Eve. And he brought them together and he performed the first wedding and, and they had the first children. Unfortunately, we don't get a good example of a godly man from Adam, unfortunately. But the family, he also created human government and he did this primarily through the instruction to the nation of Israel. And it's the best government on the planet Earth. The way God wants a people to govern themselves. But he created human government, which is important, by the way. And you should not rebel against your human government. And he created the church. We live in the church age right now as believers. We live in the church now the church, the church of, is great importance to God and, and I, 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 I kind of have communication frustration when it comes to communicating that truth to you sometimes. How important the church is to God. And, and when Paul talked about the church, he was saying that God is creating a new multicultural human society that's really what the church is we're almost we're like a new race we're a new race and and it's it is both the family of that god loves and it is the temple figuratively it is the temple that god lives in it's the church god doesn't say he dwells anywhere else where two or three are gathered together that's a church 
the body of Christ it's called. It's called the bride of Christ. It, it's a, composed of baptized believers who follow Jesus. Ephesians 3 tells us what job, Paul's job was, his commission was, his stewardship was, to make known to others what had been made known to him. And Paul starts chapter 3 in verse 1 with the intention to pray for the Ephesians. That's really what he's saying. He's getting ready. And Paul's, the great, some of the greatest prayers of the Bible are right here in Ephesians. We already went over one a couple of weeks ago. We're going to go over one next week as well. But he, in, in chapter 3, he's getting ready to pray for the Ephesians. And it says here, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. And he's getting ready. He's getting ready to start writing down a prayer for them that they can fully comprehend what God has done for them and how he has brought them together and brought them near and he loves them and brought them into the church. And he's getting ready to pray for them in verse 1, but he doesn't really do the prayer. He doesn't actually start the prayer till verse 14, where it says, For this cause I bow my knees before the Father. So verses 2 through 13 is a parenthesis that explains his sacred ministry. It explains it. And uh, I believe the sacred ministry that he he had the apostle paul had he passes it down to us from generation to generation to generation has had this sacred ministry of proclaiming the gospel through the church through the church the work of the church is to explain the gospel and preach the gospel and bring people into the church that same ministry paul has passed that down from generation to generation to generation so you have a sacred ministry as well. We do. And I want to read through the passage um, and make some more comments about it. And as Tom told me, and when I'm done, I should stop preaching, right? Tom, I should stop preaching when I'm done. <laughs> Boy, wasn't that a great sermon he preached last week? He preached for 50 minutes. I can't believe that. I can't believe you preach so long. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I'm going to read through this passage and make some comments. And I hope you can see how Paul was very excited for his ministry. He was willing to fulfill his ministry. He was completely devoted to it. And as we read, we see that Paul was a model minister because of his constant positive perspective and outlook on serving God I mean you it's hard to ever find Paul when he's discouraged or upset but yet he's always getting in trouble and but he, he's a he's just this model of a minister and maybe you can remember when we first started this series that we learned that Paul when he wrote this letter he was under house arrest you remember that when he wrote this, he's, he's, in, he's in prison. Not, not a literal prison, he's under house arrest. Uh, but he's chained to a Roman soldier at all times. That's pretty confining, isn't it? Every time you want to go to Publix, you've got to get that Roman soldier to come along with you. Get a lot of pogo time, yeah. <laughs> now, the fact that Paul went through this here he is in prison for the sake of the gospel he's chained to a Roman soldier that is evidence that he's willing to suffer loss for the ministry God gave him would you agree with that he was willing to suffer loss for the ministry that God gave him I feel like that's a, a dying thing in Christianity that people are willing to actually suffer at all for Jesus to, to give up something for him. Uh, it's a dying thing, but the Apostle Paul certainly did it and modeled it for us. In chapter 3, let me just go through this again. I'll try to go fast. Um, he says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, this is chapter 3, verse 1, for the sake of you Gentiles. So he's actually a prisoner in Rome, but... 
Paul always describes his circumstance from a spiritual perspective, from an eternal perspective. Uh, he says, I'm a prisoner of Christ. You see that? He is not going to say, that, hey man, I'm in jail, I'm a prisoner in Rome. He's not going to say that. He says, I am a prisoner of Christ for the sake of you, for the, your, for the people that I minister to. That's why I'm a prisoner. And guys, you know how important perspective is, right? Perspective is, is really everything almost. Somebody said that uh, life is 10% what happens and 90% attitude. You know, and, and so if you look at your life and all you ever see are the immediate circumstances, well, if those circumstances are good, you're going to have a happy day. But what happens if they're bad? Then you're going to have a miserable day, right? See, Paul didn't do that. He saw things from the perspective of God, from eternity, for, for, for ever. He, and he looked at things through the eyes of Jesus. So when he's in jail... He's not looking at himself as being in prison and under chains with the Roman people. He said, no, no, I'm in prison. I'm a prisoner of Christ. And he saw everything from an eternal perspective, and he trusted God that no matter what happened to him, listen to this, he trusted God no matter what happened to him, it was, it was father-filtered, it went through God's permission, so it was okay. You got me on that? perspective perspective god is in control he is your lord he is your savior whatever happens to you in this life hey god's letting it happen he says here that i'm a prisoner for christ jesus for the sake of you gentiles since or indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you. Now, okay, the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you. Now, the Apostle Paul understood that he was saved by grace. He wasn't saved by works. He didn't earn his salvation. He wasn't even looking to be saved. God came after him. Jesus came after Paul. Paul was going to kill Christians and Jesus made him a Christian. Okay? And Paul understood that tremendous grace that he had been given by God. He was saved by grace. Salvation was unmerited favor. God graciously saved the Apostle Paul and called him to be a spokesman of that same grace. And so God, the grace that God gave to Paul, Paul is preaching to other people and telling other people about that grace. I'm a minister for you, he says. Guys, if God's given you any kind of grace, do you know it's supposed to benefit other people? If you've been given grace, unmerited favor, if you've been gifted, not just with salvation, but whatever God has given you by his grace, that is not for your benefit alone. It is for the benefit of the other people within your within your life, within your church family, within your ministry. We're gifted. We are gifted to serve other people, right? I'm not gifted so I can benefit from it. That's one of the big problems within Christianity today. People take their giftedness and benefit themselves. And you need to take your giftedness and benefit other people. And that's what the Apostle Paul did here he said for this reason i paul the prisoner of christ jesus for the sake of you gentiles since you heard of the stewardship of god's grace which was given to me for you he god gave me grace so i could benefit you he says here in verse three that by re revelation there was made known to me the mystery as i wrote before in brief by referring to this when you Read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Now again, I want to say this again. Uh, God did not reveal his sacred truths to me directly. He didn't do it. 
To be specific, here's the mystery. Now Paul's saying, to be specific. This is, I'm about to tell you what it is. That the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body. By the way, he's talking about you and me. If we were not, we are all Gentiles here. I mean, there might be a Jew in here somewhere, I don't know. But most of us in here are probably Gentiles. He's talking about us. Before, we were far off from God. We were outside of the, the commonwealth of Israel. We were, we were people without uh, Christ and out God in the world. And he says, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Through the gospel. Now, he's saying that Gentiles, he's telling these people, these Ephesians, and believe me, they're excited about it. They're happy about it. They're like, thank God about it. The same way we should be about it. They, they, they have full and equal inclusion into the union of God in Christ, the family of God. They are fully into the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Guys, when you're in Christ, you're in. You're not an outsider. You're not unknown to God. When you're in Christ, you are fully in. And you're not a second-class citizen. You are part of God's family. You belong here and in church and around God and around Jesus and around the holy things of God just as much as anybody else belongs here. You're in. You're in Christ. There are no second-class citizens within Christianity. You're part of God's family. And, and, and we don't want to forget how that was made possible because Paul tells us. He's always bringing it back to the gospel. He's always bringing it back to the gospel where he tells us, he says that you're partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through what? Through the gospel. That's the good news. Guys, the gospel was revolutionary news to these Gentile people when they were hearing that God is telling them that they can be forgiven. How does the gospel start, by the way? The death of Christ. The death of Christ. And then there's the burial of Christ. You know why the burial is so important? Because it proves he was really dead. Right? You bury somebody who's really dead. And he stayed buried for three days and three nights is what the Bible says. And then he rose. Then he rose from the dead. And he stayed, was seen by hundreds and hundreds of people for 40 days. And then he ascended right in front of hundreds and hundreds of people as well. Into the clouds, into heaven. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And when you believe that, you can be saved. You are in the church. He says, of which I was made a minister. Look at this. Look at this. <laughs> Look at this which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. He's always talking about the gift of God's grace, the gift of God's grace. Everything is about God giving him grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. Now notice he says, of which I was made a minister. This is very important. Paul's telling us sacred secrets. He's telling us, he said, I'm a stewardship of sacred secrets. I was made a minister. And Paul is saying that my calling, that my message, that my ministry and the power to do my ministry was all of God. That's what he's saying. I was made a minister. I did not make myself a minister. Now listen. Anyone who is involved in church leadership and has not been appointed by God to do it is a usurper. A usurper. That's a funny word, isn't it? And I think on your outline I say what it is. On your notes. 
A usurper is a person who takes a position of authority or importance by force. You know, they just do it. They just force their way into it. They don't ask anybody's permission. They certainly don't have God's permission. But they force their self onto it without the right to do so. Now, the Apostle Paul didn't do that. He didn't force his... Now, he was... Uh, a bad leader as a Pharisee, and he did some things that were forced. He was, a, he was doing things that were, he didn't have a right to do, kill Christians. He was doing all kinds of things. But he was not a usurper when it came to the ministry in Christianity that he had, and neither were any of the apostles of the New Testament prophets. They were not, God had made them ministers. And guys, there's many people all over this world in this country uh, that are usurping their authority. They are taking it without having the right to do so. And they are harming God's people. This is happening all in the church, all over the church, uh, all over this town, in the next town, in the next town, where people are taking authority and, and rights and put positions of importance and they don't have the right to do so. They have not been appointed by God. They have not been called by God. But they're taking it. And these people are harming the church of God. They are leading people astray. And they're attempting to teach the holy word of God that they don't know really anything about. But they're trying to teach it. And they're messing people's lives up. And they're causing division and confusion. This has been going on for a long time, by the way. Tremendous division and confusion while they do it. And God did not make them a minister. And I'm, I'm just going to throw this out to you. Most of the people that call themselves ministers in the United States of America are not God-called ministers. There's much fewer much fewer in this country that were actually called by God. Much fewer. And all you have to do is hang around them and figure out, watch their life, and you'll know. You'll know they're not. This guy's a fake. This woman's a fake. The prophet Jeremiah addressed this issue when he wrote for God. He said this in Jeremiah 30, 23. He's actually speaking for God. Uh, God said this, I did not send these prophets. Do you see that? God said, I didn't send those guys. That wasn't me who sent them. I did not send these prophets, but they ran. They still went out is what he's saying. I didn't send them, but they went out. I did not speak to them, but they prophesied. They, they prophesied anyway. I didn't say anything to those people, but they're saying that I did. Verse 32, behold, I am against those who have prophesied. Here's a big, big deal in Christianity today, guys. And this is very, very important because you'll hear a lot about it. It says here, behold, I am against those who have prophesied false dreams. And I've told you before, a lot of, there's a lot of people, they'll, teachers, they're false teachers, They'll get up and they'll say, I had a dream, and oh, and then they'll go through this long dream about what they had, and then they'll make a point. And I'm thinking, I really don't care about your dream. Could you tell me what the Word of God says? I don't care about your dream. Because that's not truth. That person could have ate a bad burrito that night and had a, a dream, you know? When I eat burritos and stuff, it causes me to stay up all night, and I'm thinking all kinds of crazy things. It, <laughs> but it says here, Behold, I am against those who have prophesied false dreams, declares the Lord, and related them and led my people astray by their falsehoods and reckless boasting. Their reckless boasting. You'll find false teachers, they boast a lot, Bill. I'm telling you what, they're the smartest, most spiritual, godly people in the room, in their opinion. 
They're, they're reckless boasting, yet I did not send them. I didn't send those people. Or command them, nor do they furnish the people the slightest benefit, declares the Lord. And I just want you to know that there are many people out there that are speaking and claiming to be speaking for God. And God is saying that they did not, I didn't call them. They do not speak for me. Now, Paul tells us the qualifications, thank God. He tells us the qualifications for a God-called minister. It's written out, it's spelled out in black and white in the New Testament. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Let me read that for you real quick. I don't have that in the notes. It says here, I don't know, but Robert, look at Robert Dixon. Um, I'm going to read it in the New King James, okay? This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Now, that means that a person who is qualified to be a minister of a church or in leadership of a church, they do have to want to do it. They, ha they do have a desire. There's nothing wrong with them saying, yeah. I'd like to do that. That desire is coming from God. Because he goes on and he says, a bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine nor violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he falls into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must be have a good testimony among those who are outside he's talking about outside the church in the, in the world people have to think he's a, a decent person a good testimony among those who are outside lest he fall into the reproach and the snare of the devil now basically what that's saying is that the man who desires as, uh, is a leader in a church has to have a desire to be a church leader but that's not enough having the desire that person has must be verified and approved by other mature christians who know him to be above reproach i mean i love this church you guys have never even asked me for any of my credentials ever <laughs> you know you don't you don't know that i have an ordination slip that has like 30 signatures on it from men of God and deacons and pastors and people from different churches that were in the city that I lived that actually came to my ordination. And they put their name on my ordination. That's showing that there are many people that believed me to be above reproach. And you've never asked me for any of my other credentials, you know, my degrees and all that stuff. They're not impressive. But... uh <laughs> I did, gra wait, I, I think I graduated from elementary school. <laughs> but you have, to, you have to not only want to, but you have to be verified to be above reproach. So there's, you can't have any disqualifying characteristics to be a pastor. And by the way, being a woman is a disqualifying characteristic. Because clearly this is all being a man. And yet there are women pastors all in this town. And they're called pastors by churches. I'm not going to name the name of churches, but they're churches that you would say, hey, those are good churches. But they're bringing women pastors into it. You know, I used to like Rick Warren. I did. It really broke my heart when I found out that he's uh, ordaining women pastors in his church now. Broke my heart. Why? That's not biblical. 
A woman cannot be qualified to be a pastor. The Bible clearly says that he has to be the husband of one wife. Now, how can a woman be the husband? Well, in our society, I guess she can. <laughs> but, uh, but we know, we know back then that's not what it meant. The husband of one wife. He must be a moral man with enough sensibilities to operate his family. His wife and his kids, he needs to be able to have a good relationship and, with them and have taught them the word of God and they understand how to live their Christian life. Now when they get older, they do kind of go off on their own and that's not his fault. But, <clears throat> but if he doesn't meet those qualifications, then he cannot be a New Testament leader. And I'm speaking of the pastor specifically. Specifically, the pastor, the one who teaches, the one who preaches, the leader of the church, the human leader, should I say. Now, Paul understood that only God could make a man live up to that. Only God could do that. Uh, no man has the power within himself to do that. It's impossible to meet the qualifications of being a pastor of a church on your own. You cannot, it's impossible to do that. And that's why Paul said, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of whose power? Of God's power, of his power. So Paul took no credit for his calling, but he was very, very serious about fulfilling his calling. Very serious about it. But he took no credit for it. He wasn't looking for it, didn't ask for it. God made him a minister and he was a steward of these sacred things. Now look at the next verse in verse 8. He says, to me the very least of all saints. To me the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. Now do you get the idea that the Apostle Paul saw being chosen by God as just this tremendous gift to him. I mean, he, I think he was overwhelmed by it. I think he was uh, in love with Jesus. I think he was incredibly appreciative to God that God would save him, and not just save him, and then say, look, now this, I have a job for you, and you're going to be a steward of it. And you're, you're, you're going to, tell the whole world the known world about this new thing I'm doing it's called the church and you're a steward of it and I'm putting it all on you Paul I, you need to tell people about it and I'm going to get I'm going to be with you and I'm going to help you but Paul he, he describes himself this is the way he looked at himself he said to me the very least of the saints this is his view of himself so he's humbled by it, that God would let him preach such sacred, holy truths that nobody knew beforehand. I mean, he was thinking, you know, who am I? I'm not worthy. And I think it's important for um, all of us to understand that none of us are really worthy to do the work of God. But we do need to be qualified. There is qualifications to it. You know, sometimes we want to step into positions and do things that we're really not suited to do. We haven't been called to do. We have not been qualified to do. We're not, we don't meet the qualifications. And, and Paul understood, I am qualified. I was made a minister by God. I've met the qualifications now. But I'm still not worthy. I'm still not worthy to do it. But he loved to tell people about God's plan of the church. God's eternal plan was to bring believers together in Christ Jesus all, from all over the world. And you know, there is a universal sense of the church, but most of the time in the Bible when the word church, ecclesia is used, it is in the local sense. The gather together local church like us. 
today. It's a local church. And Paul loved to talk about the church and the idea that God was bringing Christians, believers together from all over the world. And the interesting thing about these people is that they were going to believe the same thing, they were going to say the same thing, they are taught the exact same thing in churches all over the world, but they're taught the same thing, they believe the same thing, they care about the same things, they live by the same principles, they have the same purpose, they have the same goal. And bot bottom line is this new society, this new humanity that God is creating, all they wanted to do is glorify God. That's what they want to do. That's the main thing. Glorify God through evangelism, through ministry, through fellowship, through discipleship, through worship. There's all kinds of different people within the church. There's a tremendous diversity, different races, different languages, different cultures. But guys, they believe the same thing. And I want to emphasize that. They believe the same thing. Paul says, I was called to preach in verse 9, and to bring to light what is the administration of the ministry. Now, everybody in here knows what that means, right? Nobody knows what it means. I had to work on it myself. What in the world is he talking about? When he says, we know the ministry, the mystery is the church. The new humanity, the new group of people that he's going to bring together and be one, uniting Israel, the Jews and the Gentiles all in one body of Christ. We know that the mystery means that, but he says here that to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery. So Paul is saying that I'm bringing to light how the church was to operate and all that it meant to be part of a body of Christ. That's what he's saying. So when you read the scripture, Paul is revealing page after page after page exactly how a church should operate, how Christians should function within that church and in society. There is no mystery to that anymore. You know why? He wrote it down. We know how to function in a church, how a church should operate. We know everything about it, how we are to live, because Paul brought to light the administration of the mystery, which for ages had been hidden in God who created all things. So that, here, so that is a hena clause in the Greek. It means for the purpose of. So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through what? Through the church? I'm going to say this to you guys. The church is the most important thing that you have anything to do with. I mean, obviously your family is up there, but Jesus even said that you don't let your family go, go ahead of serving him. And he is the body of Christ. You don't even let your family take precedent over serving God, serving Jesus Christ. It's important, the church. And he says here that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. So, and I believe the true church is doing that. He, the true church is making manifold, making the manifold wisdom of God made known. Guys, the key purpose of the church is to bring glory to God. The key purpose of the church is to bring glory to God. Now that goes against everything that man-centered preaching says. Because most people say, oh, I go to church for me, for me. You know, that's what people do. They go to church for themselves. And obviously there's benefits to it, going to church. But guys, we're here to glorify God. It's about Him. It's not about us. It's about Him. It's not about us. He's, he's the creator, right? 
And he created you for what? For him. You didn't create him for you. He created you for him. We are to glorify God with our life. And once you get that, once you understand that principle that you're, you are to live in total 100% submission to him and his sovereignty and serving him and glorifying him, a lot of other decisions that you make just are easy then. They're easy. You say, well, does this glorify God or does it just center on me? Well, okay, I'm not going to do that because it doesn't glorify God. It's, center, it's all about me. See how that makes decisions easier? Now, none of us are ever going to do that perfectly, but that is the standard. We are to glorify God. And I suggest to you that the true church, true believers, people, men and women of God, are doing that. They're doing that. They're glorifying God. They're genuinely born-again believers, and they gather together to worship God. Their one main priority in life is to obey God and fulfill their mission in life, whatever that might be, and there are different ones for different people according to their giftedness. But that's all they ever want to do is they want to be in the will of God. And being outside of it is unacceptable to them. And they do everything they can in their life to stay in the will of God. And a true church is doing that. They're assembled together, and that church glorifies God. And when I talk about glorifying God, what I mean by that is that they move other people to give God respect and honor. And I don't know about you, but that is desperately what I want for my own life is I want, and, and this church, is for us to move other people to look at our church or look at my life and say, you know what, I'm going to respect God because of the way that person lives. And the sad thing is, that there's so many people, one of the saddest things to me, I mean, we just don't understand how important the church is. Look, he, he says here, the manifold wisdom of God might be no, made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. He's talking about angels there. And what he's saying is, is that angels learn about the vast wisdom of God through the church. You know, I thought that was kind of cool because, you know, angels don't know everything. The church is actually teaching angels things. Angels are watching in amazement and in awe at a church. They're looking down. They're looking at the church. They say, oh, okay, God saved all these people by his grace, through their faith. And look at these people. They're so diverse. I mean, look, look different colored people, different languages, different everything. And, and they're so different, but they're all one in Christ. And angels are up in heaven thinking, wow, that's a brilliant idea. That is an amazing thing. It's a wonderful thing that God has done. There's a whole new human society of born-again believers, men and women that were spiritually dead. God made them alive. Think of that. God made them alive. They were sinners. They're saved by grace. And now they're all in union with Christ. All over the world, they're one. The church is brilliant. And I just want to say, don't take your church for granted. It's an ex your, the church is an expression of the wisdom of God. And it is loved by Jesus Christ. Your church is loved by Jesus Christ. Church is the people, of course, it's us. The church is God's means of proclaiming salvation to the world. And what we do here, when we do it right, it even amazes angels when we do it right. They're up in heaven. They're amazed at what's going on in a church. And being with your church family on Sunday morning is the best place in the world to be. 
No other place compares to it. And I thought about going off on a long list of things that people do on Sunday when they ought to be at church, but I decided not to do that because you know. But nothing compares to what happens at a church when it's done right. Nothing compares to it. It is sacred. And it, is in God's, it was in God's heart from eternity past. From eternity past, it's in God's heart. He's thinking about it for Literally, he's been thinking about it forever. It says here, this is in accordance with the eternal purpose. He's been thinking about the church forever. You know, one of the saddest things, I believe, in the universe is that professing Christians lack of importance in their view of the church. I mean, God holds this in the highest regard, and we should too. Nothing else compares to it. Verse 11, this was in accordance with his eternal purpose. He carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he was thinking about it in eternity. It didn't happen until Jesus came to the earth. The church did not come together until then. Verse 12, in whom we have boldness and confidence, access to through faith in him. So what that means is, is through Christ, through faith in Christ, you can enter his church with boldness and confidence. You believe in Jesus, you're in. It's for everybody. Everybody, anybody who wants to be saved, God will save. You hear that? Anybody who wants to be saved, God will save. He's not, if you're sitting here, you say, oh, I want to be saved, I want to be saved. God's not going to say, oh, I'm not going to save you. You, you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're in. You go with boldness and confidence, access through faith in Jesus. Therefore, I ask you, here Paul says this. Therefore, I, he's about to pray for them. But before he prays for them, he asks them this question. He says, therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulation at my suffering, at my trouble that I'm going through on your behalf. I'm going through this tribulation on your behalf for they are your glory. My tribulation, my suffering, my problems are your glory. What's he mean by that? My suffering for you shows how much God honors you. The fact that I'm willing to suffer, the fact that I'm willing to suffer for you shows how much that God honors you, how much I think about you. And Paul really is saying, look, I don't care about the tribulation that I'm going through, but I definitely care if it causes you to lose heart. I don't want you to lose heart. And, and, and Paul spent his whole life telling the Gentiles these things. You're in Christ. He, uh, you belong to his family. God has brought you near. You were far off. You're forgiven. He loves you. He chose you. He paid for your sins on the cross. He rose from the dead to secure your eternal life. These are all sacred truths that you once did not know, but now you do. And you learned it through the church. That's how you learned all that, through the church. And Paul says this, his last words is, don't, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Now, we all know why Paul said that, right? Because when you live, when you're a child of God and you live in such a sinful, ungodly world, which we do, there are so many voices out there that are drawing us away from him and drawing us away from the church and from the truth and the correct way to live. So many voices out there. They're everywhere. And it's got worse with TV and, and movies and internet. It's worse. And now everybody has a computer in their hand. You can go all kinds of places, the wrong places, and hear all the wrong things right here in your hand. So Paul is saying, don't lose heart. 
And no matter how difficult things get, and no matter how hard it looks, and even when you see me, I'm in prison, and no matter how difficult it gets, and no matter how much the world rejects us, don't give up. Don't lose heart. You have a job to do. You have steward. You're a steward of sacred secrets, divine truth that the world does not know. You're a steward of it. And we can't have you losing heart. Can't lose heart. Don't give up. And then Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he starts to pray for them, and I'll talk about that next week, how they can understand how much he loves them. Would you pray with me now? Would you pray with me? Your head's bowed and eyes closed. Father, I have really, really enjoyed studying through the book of Ephesians. I hope and pray that your people have got as much from it as I have. Just want to thank you for the church and Jesus building it. Paul teaching us about it and revealing it to us. This wonderful institution, this, this living organism in the world that is made up of believers of all different kinds of cultures and races and nationalities and language and colors and nations. And yet, we all go to the Word of God, the New Testament, the Old Testament. We read the Word of God. We all understand the same truths. We all believe the same thing. We, we uh, have the same purpose. We care about the same exact things. Our priorities are the same all over the world in your church. And we just want to thank you for it. We thank you for you doing a work in our heart. We know we're saved by grace, not by works. We know that we... We're saved with unmerited favor. We didn't earn it. We certainly don't deserve it. So we thank you for that. And God, I just want to pray that if there's anybody here today that uh, they've heard about Jesus, that he died for their sins, that he was buried, he rose again the third day. He's alive right now. And they can have that eternal life as well. They can be in the church, in your body, equal with all the rest of us we're all equal at the cross they can be saved and have the gift of eternal life and it's just through faith in jesus believing in jesus christ what a great gift what a great message we have what a great stewardship you've given us help us not to lose heart over it in jesus name we pray amen